So, welcome to Carlos Albiz University. And we are here honored and privileged to have present with us today, Ms. Jackie Rosen, who is a founding member and former board member of the Florida Initiative for Suicide Prevention. This is a 501C3 organization that was established in Florida in 1991. And in 2001, they changed its name. And it was founded predominantly by five mothers who lost children by suicide and met in a compassionate friend support group. Founded by Jackie Quay in 19, 1987. And this was only nine months after the death of her son, Mitchell Allen Rosen, by suicide. Both before the loss of her son and since that loss, Jackie continues to be a volunteer, an educator, advocate, fundraiser, and board member, excuse me, and board member in many organizations in her passionate fight against suicide. So today, I'm welcoming Ms. Rosen so that she may give and share stories, give personal and professional okay, information as to how to combat suicide. So without any further ado, please, Ms. Rosen. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, as you know, I am, I have a myriad of titles, but the most important title that I have is that I am the survivor of the suicide of my son. And that has brought me to a place where for the last 31 years I have been educated, I have worked with people, I have given my all to trying to educate everybody that I can about how we can avoid suicide. And so we're going to talk about suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention. And how you have a compassionate conversation with children, parents, family members, teachers, and children. And one of the big things that we are doing now is that we are having a group uh, called the Hope Sunshine Clubs in 48 schools in Broward County, and we just got approved to be in Dade County. And that was started because I wanted to get a program into the schools and couldn't do it any other way, so we started the clubs. And I'll tell you a little more about it later. What we're going to talk about, and what I need you to know about, is suicide prevention. Be aware and be there. Don't walk away. Don't keep secrets. And this is very, very important. We're going to talk about the facts and figures of suicide, early recognition, the warning signs of the common traits, what are the protective factors, building resiliency, and compassion. Intervention. Everyone can save a life. You do not have to be a professional. I'm a professional in not the same way that you're going to be, but I train people that they too can save a life. And we know that our clubs have saved so many lives because the kids that are involved in it learn how to do that and intervene. Identifying suicidal people and mental illnesses and brain diseases, the intervention, the do's and don'ts of how to intervene when you see somebody that's in trouble, and postvention. How do you treat somebody after they've lost someone by suicide? There are an awful lot of things that are done wrong and make it more difficult for those that are grieving and dealing with this in their families. So let's talk about, do you know how many Americans die each year by suicide? Well, you got some of the statistics from before, but 44,193 people died in the United States in 2015. And it has gone up every single year since then. Over 120 Americans die from suicide daily. 15 are young people the ages of 15 to 24. Every 11.9 minutes, there's a suicide. And every 30 seconds, there's an attempt. When I started doing this, it was every 15 minutes. So you see how it's grown. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States and in Florida. And for each person that dies by suicide, 18 to 35 now are suffering with grief. When my son died, my husband was the former mayor of the city that we were living in. In that time, we lived in Miramar. And my children had grown up in Miramar, so everybody knew us. 
There were 500 people at his funeral. 500 people were touched. And as a result of us being opening, open about the cause of our son's death, we got phone calls from, my husband's also a lawyer, lawyers, doctors, all kinds of politicians that said to us, you know, I've never talked about this before, but now that you're being open, I know I can talk to you. And that's what it's about, opening the doors. So that's what we need to do. I will tell you that the deaths have increased, suicides are the third leading cause of death, and they were talking about that earlier, of 10 to 14 years old. And in 15, there were 409 that died. The second leading cause of 15 to 44, and there were 19,374 deaths in that age bracket. The fifth leading cause of 45 to 54, the eighth leading cause of 55 to 64. And we always thought it was the elderly that died. I won the State Suicide Prevention Coordinating Council, and for seven years I kept saying to them, there is no research being done on what I call the in-betweeners. The people that are running our families, that are, on, that are working, that are taking care of their children and their parents, they were not getting any research about them. And it grew and grew and grew. So that age group has to be looked at very carefully. And because there were twice as many suicides as there were homicides. How many of you read about suicides in the newspaper unless it's about a very famous person? You don't, right? How many homicides do you read about every day? And so if we don't put it in the newspaper in the correct way, and there are ways to do that, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention have come up with a way that the newspaper should report a suicide so that it actually doesn't glorify it and cause other suicides, but it does educate the public about suicide. And that's what we're trying to also push there. In 2016, Florida has had its night highest number of suicides yet, 3,035. Average one death by suicide every three hours in the state of Florida. Think about that. Every three hours. How long have you been here? Almost three hours. Almost three hours. Somebody died by suicide. Suicide is a tenth leading cause, as we said, in Florida. There are, more, oh, there are more than twice the number of suicides than homicides. Broward County had the highest number of suicides in the state of Florida. Dade came next, Palm Beach came after that. So this is the youngest reported in Broward because I live in Broward and I know was seven and nine years of age. And we're getting them younger. I've had therapists say to me, I had a five-year-old in my office, and they said they wanted to run in front of a car because they don't want to be here anymore. Where does a five-year-old get this concept from? They don't even know what death is. So we need to do our work. This is the way that people die by suicide. Firearms. Total of 44,193. 22,018 were by firearms. 11,855 were by suspect suffocation, and poisoning was 6,816. Others were 3,504. How do women die by suicide? Anybody? Um, medication. By what? Medication. Medication. Why? We don't want to mess ourselves up. We want to be beautiful even in death. And we don't always have the ability to get a gun, but that's not what we want to do to ourselves. Well, how many men die by guns? Most of them. Most of them. And suffocation is going up. Hanging has gone up in, in, in a lot of places. So let's go to what are coexisting disorders. We talked a little bit about, is treatment equal today for substance abuse? And I don't call it mental health, by the way. I call it brain disorders and diseases. That's what it is. If you call it mental health or behavioral health, behavioral health, well, you can control your behavior. You can't control mental illnesses or brain disorders. Mental illness puts it over here. 
and physical illness over here. If we look at it as a brain disorder or disease, which it is, what's the most important organ in your body? What controls everything? So we need to change the thinking of the public that this is a disease of an organ in our body and we have to be able to go to the doctor just like for any other disease. And while I'm saying that, how many of you still say how they died by suicide? How would you say it if I asked you, somebody died by suicide, how would you say it? Somebody? Committed suicide. Committed suicide. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. That is what keeps the stigma going. There is no reason to say to not, uh, committed suicide. It's not against the law. If it was, how do you prosecute somebody after they die by suicide? Okay? What do you say? Do you say somebody's committed cancer? This is the result of a disease. They died by or they died of. And I ask everyone in this room, in my son Mitchell's name, when you walk out of this room, think about it twice before you say committed and say died by or died of. You will change the stigma. You will change the way people think about brain disorders and diseases. And that is how we get from one place to another in this terrible fight. So when somebody has a brain disorder, I got off track, as I hopefully do, <laughs> or they have a substance abuse disorder, which are both diseases, for years, just like mental and physical health, they treated one over here and one over here. We now know that coexisting disorders are more common than ever before, that we think about it the right way, one causes the other, and we don't know which one comes first. Is the person who has a brain disorder or disease called mental health, are they simply self-medicating with drugs and with, with alcohol? Or because they were using the drugs and alcohol, have they become brain disordered and have a disease? So now we know that these two things have to be treated together. How many people have gone in for treatment for substance abuse, gotten out, got through it, and then go right back to it? Because the, pers the real problem that they're dealing with wasn't dealt with. Because the brain disorder or disease wasn't dealt with. So we need to treat them together as one illness, okay? So, is treatment equally supplied? That's number one. Substance abuse and mental health, 90% of the people who die by suicide have a diagnosable brain disorder or disease, which includes substance abuse, okay? Substance abuse in itself is a brain illness and a risk factor for suicide. So that's what we've gotta be aware of. Gender disparities. Males take their own lives at nearly four times the rate of females, or 77.9% of all suicides. Females are more likely than males to think about suicide, to talk about suicide, and get help because they open up. Your professor was telling you that males don't talk about it, and that's the truth. They hide it. And that's one of the big reasons for the gender change in the two about it. Uh, suicide is the seventh leading cause of death for males and the 14th leading cause of death for females. So it's about twice as much. Firearms are the most commonly used for males, as we said, and poisoning for females. In the 2016-17 school year, there were 14 Broward County students that died by suicide. That we know about. Why don't we know the real numbers? Because the medical examiner doesn't put it all the, way down, all the time on the, um, on the report. Parents want, don't want it reported as a suicide. Oh, it was an accidental overdose. Oh, it was just an accident. They didn't mean to shoot themselves. Okay? They didn't mean to hang. They were doing that thing to, uh, what do you call it? Asphyxiation. Asphyxiation things. 
They didn't really mean to hang themselves. So that's what we know that more teenagers and young adults die from suicide than from cancer, heart disease, AIDS, birth defects, stroke, pneumonia, influenza, and chronic lung disease all combined. Scary, isn't it? Really, really scary. So these are, what does social media have to do with it? And this is a research that was just done recently. I don't know if that's what you were uh, talking about when you did that report, but in 2007, when social media became available to teens, the suicide rate doubled. And these are some of the things why they were, is there a problem? Oh no, I don't want the lights to go on. Oh. <laughs> Um, it increases isolation. We know that the kids now are sitting in their room or wherever going like this or on the video or on the um, on their computer and they aren't communicating or having face-to-face -face communication. We as human beings need to communicate live. We are social animals. That's what keeps us going our social interactions. And if we don't have them and we're isolated, we become depressed. And so the need to keep up with others is another problem. The need to show only having successes, never doing anything that's not a success. These aren't realistic. The constant comparisons and bullying that happens and the anonymity that they have on the social media, they can say anything or do anything they want, the immediacy of everything. They can't wait to do it. The average teen spends five hours a day on social media. Five hours? That's unbelievable. It causes real harm by decreasing self-worth, bullying. They, it becomes an addiction because it's their primary way of communicating. And I will absolutely confess that my phone sits on my night table. So the first thing I do in the morning is pick up my phone and look at my emails to see what I'm doing and look at my schedule for the day. The last thing I do at night is put down my phone on the night table. Well, if you're not an adult and you're depending on that for your whole self-worth, what do you think it does to a teenager? So what we need to do it causes real harm because of the self-worth. It can become an addiction. And the open communication between teens and their parents is lost. How many of you have walked into a uh, restaurant and seen the family sitting at the yeah. table all on their own phones? Yeah. It makes me want to scream. Yeah. It really does. The family meal where you sit and talk. The isolation produces feelings of helplessness and hopelessness, suicidal thoughts and actions. It also decreases the development of interpersonal skills and relationships, successful person-to-person -person communication, the ability to be empathetic. What is important about empathy as a human being? Everything. If we don't know how other people feel and be able to understand their emotions, we've lost part of our humanity. It's very important. And the ability to caringly use social media, media, carefully think about what you're saying and what you're doing. It also increases the rate of stress, depression, anxiety, and suicide. And depression is the number one cause of suicide. So these are what social media is doing. What is prevention? Prevention is being proactive and enabling individuals and systems to meet the challenges of life events and create and reinforce conditions that promote healthy behaviors and lifestyles. Healthy behaviors and lifestyles. In other words, everyone in this room and everyone in your family and everyone that you have relationships with can help save a life by learning about the signs, by caring enough to intervene, and by sharing compassionate conversations. It's a simple thing. It's just being human.
empathy, and care. So which of these statements is true? And I think they answered these when they did their presentation. Suicidal people want to die. Do they? What do they want? They want some relief. relief. They want relief. And we're going to, I'm going to show you a, a, something that talks about how a suicidal person feels. And I tried to get there after my son died. I wanted to understand how he felt. And I actually tried to get there. People talk about suicide won't do it. True or false? False. false. Absolutely. Suicide is an impulsive act. False. 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 They need time to plan it. Yeah. They need the things to do what they need to do it. So it, it gives us time, if we can find out, to intervene and help. Suicide, a person that attempts suicide won't do it again. False. I know a young lady false. who attempted 14 times before she died. 14 times. We kept trying to stop her. Their family types trying to stop her. We couldn't. And a person can control the feelings that lead to suicide. And we're going to talk a little bit about the chemical and the emotional part of that. So brain to me, these are the three things that are very important to remember that cause brain disorders or diseases. Number one is biological. It does run in families. And it runs in families because they're talking about now a gene that makes you susceptible to suicide. It also runs in families because it becomes an acceptable way to deal with things. And if it's, it's an acceptable way for a family member to do it, then it becomes acceptable for other families to do it. But basically, there is a physical component to the DNA. And we know that now. We also know that it's neurological. It's the chemicals in the brain that change. The hippocampus, we can now see, actually, in long-term depression, shrinks. And they can't get it back. The amygdala sometimes swells and presses on the hippocampus and causes reactions that we don't understand why they're happening, except that that's physically the changes in the brain. So the more that we can see about the brain, the more we are learning what's happening when somebody gets to the point where they can't stand the pain anymore. Okay. Environmental factors, trauma. Trauma is one of the biggest factors in suicide. And the earlier that the trauma occurs, the harder it is for the person to change the reaction to that trauma, and the more likely they are to have brain disorders and diseases and die by suicide. And we know that the earlier. There are no boundaries set for those affected by brain illnesses because they cross all ages, genders, racial, cultural, socioeconomic, doesn't matter. The number one cause is depression, which we've already talked about. Um, just like any other disease, it's, it's part of the body's changes. These are the 20 general, pop, uh, general population signs of suicide. Isolation, withdrawal from family and friends and activities, sleep disturbances, too little or too much, changes in eating behavior. By the way, that's up here on the, on the all these, a lot of these things are up here. Uh, eating behaviors, eating too much or not enough, inability to concentrate or make decisions, unexplained fatigue, constantly having no energy, depression, sadness, crying, loss of ability to know joy, risky behaviors promoted by aggression, hostility, not taking medications. Some people who just stop taking their medications. Now, I don't mean just therapeutic medications for brain disorders. I'm talking about people who are diabetic and stop taking their medications, who have other illnesses and stop taking their medications. Um, let's see. Take, talking about our preoccupation with uh, death, low self-esteem, helplessness, hopelessness, oversensitivity to criticism, loss of interest in personal appearance, hobbies, school, social uh, work, Somatic symptoms and complaints. There, uh, the elderly often visit their family doctor 
within a month, complaining of physical problems, physical pains. They don't associate it with the brain disorder. And then they'll die within a month. And how many, how many family doctors are really asking the right questions? I've been asking that for years. How do we get our family doctors really educated about asking the right questions? Extreme anxiety, agitation, and rage behavior, or manic depressive behavior, giving away prized possessions. There was a teacher who, when I was teaching in the school, said to me, two years ago, I had a student come to me and bring me his favorite poster from his bedroom and asked me to hang it in the classroom and never take it down. What happened? Two weeks later, he died by suicide. And he said to him, why did he say to him, never take it down? He wanted to be remembered. He didn't want to be forgotten. Um, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Where am I? Mental illnesses or previous suicide attempts. Suicide of a friend or a family history. Personal contacts with media or significant for people. Recent loss of a family member. Making a suicide plan, access to guns, pills, and means. Saying goodbye. My son visited five friends the night before he died. Not one of them picked up the phone and said to us, and we had been watching him 24-7. We knew he was in trouble. We had him at a psychiatrist. He was on medication. And we went to sleep, and when we got up in the morning, he wasn't there. He, was, he had gone and done it. So um, a recent loss, making, saying goodbye, feeling helpless, helpless, desperation, guilt, and no self-worth, sudden change in behavior, use of alcohol or drugs are very often something that you have to look at. Um, cultural and religious beliefs sometimes do have a reason involved in that. Um, the first time years ago I went to a Catholic church because they had said for so many years it was a sin. I don't know what your religion is, but it's changing. We realize now, and that's why it's so important to let people know this is the result of a disease. This is not a sin. So. They brought me in because one of the students in their teen group had attempted. Okay? This is the warning signs for children. Unexplained fears, being very angry and irritable most of the time, or having temper tantrums, doing the same thing over and over, OCD, we were talking about that earlier. Attacking people, themselves, or animals, which again is no empathy. That's a big sign with children when they start setting fires or Hurting animals, you have to, there's something definitely wrong. Frequent nightmares, setting fires, unable to sit or concentrate, changing score, hearing voices. Schizophrenia is rare in young children, but it does happen. Lack of empathy or caring about others. I was going to show a film, but it's 10 minutes, and it's about a college student who, in a two-week period, because he got caught making drugs for himself, mushrooms, um, he got caught and he was top student, had all kinds of uh, excellent background and everything you can imagine, perfect. Well, now he wasn't perfect anymore. So when we showed this film, we asked, what are the signs that you saw in this film? It's on our website, so if you want to see it, it's the Cody Zakari story. And as you'll see this, this was in 2011 when he died. I, at the end, I say there's a suicide every 15 minutes. So, what are the experiences that contribute to depression? Family problems, divorce, abuse, financial problems, legal problems, health problems, <coughs> bullying in all ages. Adults get bullied as yeah. much as kids do yeah. uh, in a different way, <coughs> very often at work with bosses and uh, other people that they work with. It's just as bad for adults as it is for children. Health problems, legal problems, uh, trauma, and barriers to receiving mental health care. Okay. Three common traits, and this is very important. This was Dr. Thomas Joyner um, did this research. He lost his father to suicide. He's up at Florida State, I believe. And he found out through this research that these three things are true of everybody that dies by suicide. Now, how many of you ever heard somebody say, oh, they took their life, that's so selfish. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. 
Well, the reason that they take their life, not only to stop the pain, but because they are guilt about their existence, and they feel they are a burden to themselves, to their families, to their friends, to the world, that the world would be better off without them. Does that sound selfish? No. That's not selfish. And that just makes my hair stand up when I hear that. The other thing is that not belonging or feeling alienated. They don't feel they're a part of the things that are important in their life. So they feel alienated. And a low sense of belongingness is the experience one alienates families, circles of friends, whatever they're involved in. And then there's the acquired ability to self-harm or legal injury. How important is our preservation, our self preservation in our human makeup. It's probably the most important thing that we have. That's what fight or flight is about. That's what we do all kinds of things to survive. Can you imagine giving that up? I tried. I called my doctor and I said to him, I need my prescription refilled for three months. So he gave me a prescription for 100 pills. I went to the, which was stupid. I went to the pharmacy, I said to my, my family, I'm, I'll be back later. Went to the pharmacy, picked up the pills, went to the place where my son died. Parked my car where he parked his car. Sat in my car with the pills, trying to feel what he felt. Now as depressed as I was, and believe me, I was depressed, I couldn't get to where he was. Because I was an adult, I had been through things, I knew how to look at things with a clear perspective. I had a husband and a daughter and parents that I couldn't do this to. And so what I learned was that I couldn't get there because I didn't have the same brain disorder or disease that he had. That was very, very enlightening to me. So I went home and I took my pills opened up the cabinet, put them in the cabinet, looked in the mirror and said to myself, my goodness, I started to laugh. You idiot, you didn't really expect to die by suicide. You weren't really going to take the pills. You didn't take any water with you. That's where it was all about. Understanding. And that's what every survivor does. Why, 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 why? How, 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 how? How can I understand this? And so that was my way of testing that self-preservation. How do you describe how a suicidal person thinks? Cognitive constriction, tunnel, tunnel vision, not able to see the light at the end of the tunnel. There's no way out. Dichotomous thinking, everything is black and white. I stop the pain or I can't stand the pain. Now I love this word, this word, psyche. I was so excited when I found it in the dictionary. What does it mean to you? We all talk about physical ache. Psych ache is just as bad if not worse. And it comes with physical pain ache. So, Think about that profound emotional pain that they have. Perturbation, the need to take action. When you have a problem, what do you do? You look at the problem, you look at all the possible solutions. When you find the solution that you think will work, well, you take action. That's what they're doing. Exactly that, solving the problem. And so if we think of it that way, we think of it differently. The hopelessness and the need to take action. I used to say that the best way to describe the way a person feels was that they were in a, in a, um, a mind and they couldn't get out of the darkness. Now they get them out of the mind. I found out a lot of people are getting out of minds. So I came up with a new one. Imagine that you were in a fire, heaven forbid, and burned over 80% of your body. You know the pain from burns is incredible. 
And you go to the hospital and you're all cleaned up and you're wrapped up and the doctor comes in and he says, uh, well, I'm just not sure how I'm gonna tell you this, but every pain medication in the world has been compromised. And because of that, we don't know if or when we'll ever have any pain medications. So I can't tell you how long you're gonna be in pain or if it'll ever stop, or if I'll ever be able to help you stop it. What would you do to stop the pain? That's where they're at. And that's hard to understand for us, but it is true, that's the way they feel. So what are our protective factors? Feeling that you belong, that you're cared about, that you're not a burden, a sense of purpose and accomplishment, access to um, access to resources. I'm going to skip some of this. Um, support of networks, independence, peer group support, which I'm going to talk about, the Hope Sunshine Club, which is a club that gives, we have a 33-week curriculum, and we talk about everything the kids deal with, from suicide, bullying, substance abuse, communication skills, dating violence, you name it, we talk about it. Okay. This is our Hope Club, and this is the, what we do with that. And then this is the 10 steps of problem solving, which we also teach. Um, this is what you need to do. Listen, protect, connect, and follow up. Don't leave the person alone after you've gotten them services. Stay with them. They came to you for a reason. They trust you. Don't leave them. And I'm going to go quickly because I want to read you, and I told you some of the things about the five questions. How many of you know the five questions they ask somebody when you think they're suicidal? Are you thinking of injuring yourself? Are you thinking of killing yourself? Or dying by suicide? Do you have a plan? Do you have what you need to carry out the plan? And have you decided when you would carry out the plan? Then you know. If they say yes to one of these things, you make sure they get help. I want to read you one of the poems that's in my book, uh, now that I have to go through this quickly. <laughs> I will tell you that grieving, the grieving process, we say, is like friendly friends. No two people do it the same. You have to let them do it the way, but be there. This is the uh, poem, my book is how I got through it and how other people that I dealt with, it's called the butterfly on my shoulder because my son used to come home and rub my shoulders at the end of the day. How was your day, mom? And I've always loved butterflies since I was a kid and they signify the change from one form to another and we know by physics, energy or never dies, it just changes from one form to another. So the name of my book, and it's written with my pen name, uh, is the butterfly on my shoulder. And here's one of the poems. What's the difference between physical illness and that of the mind? I've searched and searched and a difference between them I cannot find. It really bothers me when someone says that it's all in his head. Because the brain is an organ whose health by an MRA, I can be read. Our body is one entity that we hope works in perfect harmony. When we get sick, which is part that is broken is not different, don't you see? My child died of an illness as part of his body, not separate from the other. Why do people differentiate and say they are different from one another? The word disease means that there is dis-ease in the body as a whole. Changing how people treat mental illness is now my ultimate goal. I want to make them understand that my child suffered from an illness like any other. I want them to treat my family like anyone who's lost a child, a sister, or a brother. Not stigmatize my child's death like everyone used to do with cancer. We know that research and openness promoting prevention is really the answer. Mental illness can be successfully treated when help is sought. Stopping the stigma will make the seeking of treatment more easily bought. I want to separate the word to all that the need is so great. Spread the word to all that the need is so great. And let everyone know what a difference they can each make. Thank you very much.
It's a few minutes after six, but if you have any questions, I'm here. And if you would kindly fill out the survey, it'll take a second. I really appreciate it.